and thank you for joining this afternoon. And I would like to introduce Chief of Transplant Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dr. Tour. Thanks a lot, Stacey. And I, I want to welcome you from my side uh, as well. Um, we are proud to offer you this um, uh, combined uh, um, uh, effort uh, between the National Kidney Foundation and uh, the Kidney and Pancreas uh, Transplant Program at Brigham and, at Brigham and uh, Women's Hospital on the new kidney healthcare initiative and other aspects uh, that are relevant uh, to you as patients with end-stage renal disease and uh, transplant patients. Stacy introduced me already briefly. I'm the Chief of Transplant Surgery, Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School, and uh, together with uh, Dr. Schandrager, I um, direct uh, the Prigham and Women's Kidney and Pancreas uh, Transplant uh, Program. I want to particularly thank um, uh, Stacy Sennett uh, from the uh, National Kidney Foundation and our nurse manager um, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Wendy Valerius, um, for all their help and support in organizing this meeting. I don't want to miss on uh, thanking our sponsors, Novartis, Veloxis, and uh, Sanofi for supporting this uh, kidney crossroad uh, webinar. Excellence in patient care, excellence in care for patients with end-stage renal disease and uh, patients uh, pre and post transplantation is really at the heart of our matter of what we do here in our kidney transplant program at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I think the agenda that we have today for this Kidney Crossroad uh, webinar is very well prepared to provide you with important critical information that covers important aspects of the new kidney health uh, uh, initiative, um, uh, peritoneal dialysis, home hemodialysis uh, um, aspects that are so important uh, for the care of patients with end-stage renal disease and those um, for waiting for a transplant. I want to hand it over at this point uh, to uh, Dr. Schandrager, who will be moderating this webinar and also introduce the agenda for you in more detail. So welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining. I would also like to extend uh, the welcome to all of our speakers uh, and um, also to um, all of the people who are uh, viewing this. Uh, the Kidney Crossroads was a program that we started at the Brigham Women's Hospital a couple of years ago. And it was really an effort uh, to reach out to our patients and also to patient providers such as uh, dialysis nurses, technicians, social workers, dietitians, and family members uh, who really have to look after uh, our patients who have chronic kidney disease. And the mission of the Kidney Crossroads was really to help uh, educate our patients and also allow them to interact with us uh, in, in a meaningful way. So in that spirit uh, today, we have created a program. We had hoped to do this live, just like the other Kidney Crossroads that we had done in, in previous years, but unfortunately, uh, because of uh, the current times, we have to do this virtually. Uh, having said that, I think that you'll find today we have a very interesting uh, agenda. And we are going to start today with Dr. Malika Mendu. Uh, I have great pleasure to introduce her. She's one of my colleagues and uh, on faculty uh, at the Brigham Women's uh, Hospital. Uh, she is also the medical director of the Partners Population Health and uh, Brigham and Women's Quality and Safety uh, 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 programs within, within the hospital. She's also been instrumental in advising uh, the government in um, what we call the Kidney Health Initiative. And this is going to mean a great change, uh, we hope, for all of our patients with kidney disease. And she's going to explain uh, to you what that program means and, and what the implications are uh, for all of our patients. Great, thank you so much for the introduction, Anil, and thanks to all of you for joining today. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a nephrologist at Brigham and Women's, and I also work in uh, both population health management at Partners for Mass General Brigham, 
and I work for uh, the Quality and Safety Department at Brigham and Women. Uh, and I have the um, opportunity to uh, be part of our um, American Society of Nephrology, the ASN Quality Committee. And in part of that role, I've been uh, involved in providing guidance along with other members of the committee regarding the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. And some of you on this call may be aware of what the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative is, um, but uh, for even those of you who have heard the term, there may be a, a lot that is not known about what is actually in the, the initiative. And, and most importantly, what does it mean for you, um, meaning patients, providers, and caregivers uh, in terms of the ramifications of this initiative. So that's what I hope to lay out today in this presentation. And we'll have time at the end of the presentation for question and answers. So first, my disclosures. I provide uh, consulting services to Bayer and no other disclosures. So uh, the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. Uh, so this is a executive order that was signed by President Trump on July 10, 2019. And here's a picture of President Trump uh, signing the executive order. Uh, in addition, other members uh, included in the picture of the administration include Secretary Azar, um, who's a gentleman on the left, uh, standing, standing on the left, as well as um, Seema Varma, um, who leads uh, CMS, who's, who's on the right side of the picture. And then, as you can see, there were um, many patients, uh, caregivers, and uh, providers who joined the signing as well. Um, it has been um, uh, hailed as a major step forward in federal kidney policy. And we're going to go through some of the specifics around uh, what the initiative includes. Uh, but I think first, before we discuss what the initiative uh, refers to and what's, what, how it impacts patients, we have to touch upon uh, the history of kidney policy. Uh, and, and some of you on this call may know about the history, but want to reiterate the history because I think that provides the right context in terms of how to understand uh, what, where we are now and why the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative um, is a step forward in terms of advancing kidney health policy. So we'll touch upon the history of kidney policy. Then I'll go into some detail about the goals of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. Um, there are three main goals that I will detail uh, and some, spend some time discussing. Uh, then I'll transition to, um, based on those goals, how the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative actually uh, works and relates to the health system as it exists today. Uh, and we'll share some details about that. And finally, uh, and, and I think most importantly, what changes for you as a patient and a caregiver and a provider? How does this um, in any way impact the care that you're receiving or the care that you might receive uh, in the next uh, few years? Okay. So first we'll start, as I mentioned, with some of the history behind the federal kidney policy. Um, and what's very interesting is a lot of the history actually started at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, so to go back to the very beginning, uh, in 1943, uh, during wartime, the first artificial kidney was developed in the Netherlands by Dr. William Claw. Uh, and so that was the first attempt at trying to replace the functions of the kidney with the machine. Uh, then that technology was adapted and used in 1947 in the United States. And this um, article from Life Magazine uh, is, as you can see, dated 1947, um, was, was one of the landmark articles that highlighted that the artificial kidney um, now exists and that uh, the human organ, a vital human organ, is replaced by salt solution and cellophane. And you can see in, in these pictures what the dialysis machine looked like, um, you know, fairly large um, and, and round and uh, utilizing cellophane. Um, 
So, so that was the first uh, type of technology that was employed. And then really the development of dialysis into a therapy that could be scaled uh, to multiple hospitals, to multiple patients, uh, that could be said the knowledge could be disseminated. Uh, that a lot of that took place um, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, another hospital that was very much involved as well was uh, the the Seattle in, in Seattle, uh, the the University of Washington um, group there, and uh, some of the Seattle nephrologists were also involved. But a lot of the pioneering work took place at Brigham and Women's, and so you can see here some of the pictures. Uh, and, and these are actually accessible. You can see the links below. Uh, and if you have some time, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's fascinating going through the various pictures. Uh, some of the pictures on the BrighamandWomen.org uh, renal division website that goes through our history. So you can see here uh, this picture from the 1950s, a team of nurses and physicians caring for a young patient on dialysis. And you can see that the machine evolved to some extent, but not, uh, not that much from, from the 1947 machine. Um, but over, over um, several years in the 50s, uh, collaborating with Dr. Kolf, the um, Brigham and Women's uh, came up with this Kolf Brigham kidney. Um, and then in 1954, um, uh, arguably the seminal event in uh, kidney history, the first kidney transplant was performed at Brigham. And what you can see here is a picture of uh, the, the, those involved in the first kidney transplant. Uh, the, in the middle is, uh, the, uh, of the gentleman standing in the, in the background is Dr. Merrill, who is one of uh, the leaders of uh, the, the kidney uh, department at Brigham and Women's, really one of the pioneers. And in the front uh, are the, uh, the twin brothers who were involved in the first successful kidney transplant. Uh, and, uh, and so this was a really landmark and seminal moment. Uh, and fortunately, it, it did happen at Brigham Women's Hospital. So next slide, um, reviews uh, the evolution of uh, dialysis in the 50s and in the 60s. And you can see from this very large, cumbersome machine that really could only be uh, reasonably employed in the hospital came developments uh, that enabled outpatient hemodialysis and then later peritoneal dialysis. Uh, and what you can see in this uh, top right picture is hemodialysis occurring in the home. And this paper that outlined a 13 month experience uh, utilizing the hemodialysis machine in the home. And you can see that the machine uh, definitely evolved uh, from the 40s to the 60s and more compact, more uh, technologically savvy appearing uh, machine. Um, and you can see some of the authors, including Dr. Merrill, um, who was uh, really instrumental in um, creating this technology and also ensuring that it was disseminated to other hospitals so that it could be utilized. Um, and then similarly, the peritoneal dialysis program evolved um, largely at, at Brigham as well. You can see one of the nurses uh, in, the, in the 1960s helping a patient um, with the peritoneal dialysis. And, uh, and that also shifted to, a, to the home setting in terms of being able to complete the dialysis. So you can see from the 40s to 50s to 60s that there was evolution of, um, of dialysis. But ultimately the challenge was that uh, this was still uh, a treatment that um, required a lot of resources um, from nursing care to the hospital to supplies. And ultimately in terms of the financial reimbursement for this treatment, um, and it was very, difficult um, to allocate the resources that were needed for dialysis and to make decisions. And, and this is an um, article that was um, published in Life Magazine and there was an NBC News documentary in the, in the 19, early 1960s. Um, and the name of the article, title of the article was Who Shall Live? Um, and it highlighted how decisions were made about who received dialysis at the um, the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center, I mentioned Seattle was one, uh, in addition to the 
Austin area, Seattle was another area that was also um, uh, in parallel developing um, some of the outpatient dialysis. Um, they had a six person committee who basically would decide who gets dialysis and um, essentially would make this decision of who should live. And you can see here, um, you know, they, they blurred the faces of these uh, panelists, but these panelists were six um, members of the community, actually. There was only one physician on the group and the physician was not a nephrologist. Um, and they were presented patients from, by nephrologists um, and those patients had to be um, uh, younger than 45, had to be quote unquote uh, mentally stable, uh, and uh, had to not have a history of hypertension and vascular disease and um, children were excluded. Uh, uh, anybody who didn't have somebody who could help support them uh, would, would have been excluded from this. So really a very refined uh, small group of people were ultimately thought to be eligible to receive dialysis. And, and so this got a lot of national attention as being just unfair uh, and, and not a good process and, and not sustainable moving forward. So this is, this is the evolution of uh, kidney policy, essentially kidney therapy, and then the policies um, over about a 15, 20 year period. So it was in the early 1970s that um, there was more attention paid on the side of congressional members and, and the White House um, and, and um, leaders who would ultimately be able to make decisions about coverage for kidney care. Um, and I wanted to share with you uh, a quote that was shared by Shep Glazer, who's a dialysis patient, and he shared this story with uh, the Ways and Means Committee in 1971. And you can see here his very powerful words. He says, I'm a 43-year-old, married for 20 years, with two children, ages 14 and 10. I was a salesman until a couple of months ago, until it became necessary for me to supplement my income to pay for the dialysis supplies. I tried to sell a non-competitive line, was found out and was fired. Gentlemen, what should I do? End it all and die, sell my house for which I worked so hard and go on welfare. Should I go into the hospital under my hospitalization policy? Then I cannot work. Please tell me if your kidneys fail tomorrow, wouldn't you want the opportunity to live? Wouldn't you want to, to see your children grow up? So that was the testimony in 1971. Um, and, and testimony by this patient and, and stories from other patients and providers really moved Congress um, to, to act and uh, think about uh, the importance of covering patients with kidney disease. And so as a result, in 1972, um, uh, Richard Nixon, President Nixon signed legislation that then ensured Medicare coverage for ESRD patients. And so from 1973 onwards, the ESRD Medicare benefit began. And so this gives us the story and the history of why end-stage renal disease um, or, or end-stage kidney disease, as the terminology is now changing, um, is guaranteed for those who need dialysis or transplant because of this history of um, the scarcity of resources and the decision-making around who should get dialysis. And so since then, there has been coverage guaranteed. So that leads us to the present time, which is um, the time of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative and the goals. Um, so given that history, we're jumping ahead now uh, from 1973 to uh, 2019 um, when this was announced. And the question is, why do we need the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative? What has changed over the last 50 years? And I would say the case for the AKH, I've listed some points on the, on the left-hand side, but I would say at a very high level, not a lot has changed. Um, the end stage renal disease Medicare benefits still exist. Patients are covered under uh, that benefit. Um, the dialysis organizations did develop um, uh, organizations that provide dialysis to patients often in, uh, in center units. Um, but the actual technology uh, behind um, dialysis has not advanced very much. 
And other than dialysis, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis and transplant, which all existed back in the 1970s, we don't have um, uh, newer technologies to help um, treat uh, those who have kidney failure. So that is at a high, very high level. I will also say some of these points are, um, we know that for patients who are on dialysis for an extended period of time, um, there are often poor outcomes um, in terms of uh, disability and, um, and, uh, and, and other um, outcomes, other important clinical outcomes. We know that dialysis is not always patient-centered, meaning the patient is not at the focus of uh, the decision-making um, and is not um, oftentimes uh, driving um, what is going on with the care, and that is an area that needs a lot of focus and attention to remedy. Um, we know that there are low rates of home dialysis, particularly compared to other countries, um, for example, uh, up in the north in Canada or um, Hong Kong is a country that has a very high home dialysis rate and similarly other Asian countries. Um, we know that there are few therapies to treat and prevent kidney disease and progression. Uh, the wait list for a transplant is long for a deceased uh, donor transplant. It's 100,000 currently waiting. And finally, uh, kidney care is costly, um, accounting for um, in aggregate uh, 114 billion in 2016. That's all patients um, with kidney care and uh, potentially attributable costs. So these are some of the uh, key points that are listed in the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative background in terms of why this is needed. Um, and many patients and providers and caregivers um, advocated uh, uh, through either American Society of Nephrology or other National Kidney Foundation, other, um, other advocacy groups to say that there needs to be a change in terms of how we think about kidney disease. So now I'm gonna get into the three goals um, and, uh, and we'll outline what the goals, uh, what the goals state and um, how uh, the initiative proposes that those goals are achieved. So you can see goal one is to reduce the development of end-stage kidney disease by 25% by 2030. Um, so that's a, a lofty goal. So in 10 years, we're gonna have 25% uh, fewer uh, of the total population uh, needing uh, uh, dialysis or transplant. And the way that is proposed to achieve this goal is um, by not actually putting forth new programs, but rather supporting those programs that already exist. For example, the, the Centers for uh, Disease Control um, has a, a surveillance system with respect to kidney disease. Um, and so supporting that effort, um, supporting ongoing federally funded research, um, particularly research that's looking at uh, therapies to reduce progression to end-stage renal disease, thinking about prevention programs, for example, the National Diabetes Prevention Program, which is a leading cause of end-stage renal disease, kidney CKD and end-stage renal disease, so supporting those types of programs. And finally, supporting artificial intelligence and disease management programs that have been shown to have an impact in terms of stemming the progression of chronic kidney disease. Um, so that is goal one. Uh, goal two is, I would say, really at the heart of the initiative. Most of the focus of what is uh, proposed in the initiative centers around goal two. Um, so goal two, advocates for 80% of new end-stage kidney disease patients receiving home dialysis um, in the home or, um, or uh, receiving a transplant. Um, and so that is a, is a pretty lofty goal. Um, we are um, less than half of that if you look at um, all of the end-stage renal disease patients and whether they've ever been transplanted or or been on dialysis, so that is a very high goal. Um, and that is achieved by supporting uh, things like the USRDS database that collects data on um, our end-stage kidney disease patients, 
Um, it's supporting ongoing efforts. For example, the CDC's making dialysis safer, um, supporting uh, chronic health patient portal. So helping patients who have chronic diseases like kidney disease be able to access their own health records, to be able to communicate with their provider. Um, supporting the Kidney um, X uh, uh, initiative. So the Kidney X initiative is a public private partnership that seeks to advance innovative therapies. Um, and so that is, is, a, is a major um, stream in terms of potentially coming up with new innovative therapies that would uh, potentially be able to replace, for example, uh, dialysis. And then streamlining any kidney therapy innovation um, and uh, so that um, in an ideal setting that would um, uh, be received by the patient as soon as possible um, and really streamlining that process. But really key, in addition to all of the work in supporting ongoing initi initiatives, is to create these new value-based kidney disease payment models. And uh, value-based payment models is, is a term that's um, been used now for the past 10 years um, with the um, Affordable Care Act uh, or Obamacare as it's also known. Uh, there was a shift towards thinking about more value-based care, meaning um, instead of a traditional uh, payment when a uh, service is provided and payment is, is received by the provider or the health system or hospital, you think more about how do you improve the quality of the care uh, for patients uh, and actually lower costs. Um, and, and that's what this type of value-based uh, model is thought to be. And there are value-based models in other areas of care. For example, in primary care, uh, there are value-based models that many of the primary care providers have participated in. So um, with these value-based uh, kidney disease payment models, the idea is can we align what is in it, how we're paying providers with what is uh, what is um, in the best interest for patients, what the patients prefer, and what we know will improve quality of life. Um, and so I'm going to go a, a bit into some of the details around these payment models in my next session. But I will say that a lot of this is focused on home dialysis or transplant, um, with the understanding that those are treatments that better align in, in many situations with patient preference um, and lead to improved quality of life. And finally, goal three is to double the number of kidneys available for transplant by 2030. And here, um, there are um, some efforts related to how organs are procured um, and how those organizations that procure or, or obtain the organs are measured in terms of um, potentially um, improving the recovery of organs. And so there are some um, changes that have been uh, proposed to those metrics to help, um, to help guide that and help improve the number of kidneys available. Similarly, expanding the use of hepatitis C virus positive kidneys would potentially help expand the pool. And then finally, supporting the living donors by expanding reimbursement of travel, of other related expenses um, uh, that would then help support those who do want to give uh, a kidney and donate a kidney um, without um, unduly, bur unduly burdening them um, with uh, excessive costs. So those are the goals of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, um, those three goals. And um, in this next section, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on the second goal, because again, the, the goals one and three are largely around supporting existing efforts, whereas it's goal two that really um, sets the stage in terms of these new payment models. And so uh, this top graphic um, was uh, put forth by, by kidneynews.org, and it's one that has been shared um, uh, by many organizations because it's very informative in terms of how these payment models work. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of detail, so I'm going to try to uh, hit the high points in terms of what is um, probably most interesting to patients and caregivers. Um, but essentially, as I said, these are um, 
uh, now uh, value-based payment models. And again, there the idea is improving quality and reducing costs in a way that is patient-centered and, and improves outcomes for patients. So there are two types of models. So the first is a, a what we call the mandatory model, meaning that um, this is a model that's gonna roll out across the country um, regardless of whether the dialysis unit, the providers, um, you know, have a voice or not, it is going to happen. Um, and the way that it is going to happen um, is that the uh, uh, administration, the CMS, is going to um, randomly assign half of the country um, based on various hospital referral regions um, uh, to, uh, and this is the, uh, the dialysis unit and the providers who care for patients at the dialysis unit, half of them will be in this model called the end-stage renal disease treatment choices. And there, there will be measurements in terms of home dialysis and transplantation rates. And based on those rates, there will be um, potentially upwards or downwards payments um, to the units and the providers. The other half of the country will not have any impact to their payment. And so you can see here that, and there are a lot of nuances um, about this model and, 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 uh, and adjustments potentially made to how things are defined. But I would say overall, the message here is we should be um, moving towards more home dialysis and more transplant. And now there will be some incentivization um, or you could think about it as financial support um, for the units and for the providers to be able to, to do that. Um, so that's the mandatory model, um, which is going to roll out. We are still not clear about the timeline. Um, the other uh, type of model is what we call the optional model, and that's second half in the blue of the graphic. And there you can see there are a couple of different versions. Uh, there's a version called Kidney Care First, where the, it would be the nephrologist practice um, who would be uh, taking the lead in terms of participating versus another model where it could be the nephrologist and, for example, a dialysis uh, organization um, working together. Um, but essentially here, the idea is now there would be um, kind of a bundle, we call it capitated or bundled payment for taking care of patients with more advanced chronic kidney disease, um, as opposed to a, a, a more of a, a fee for service is what we call it. When you get a service and then you pay a fee, uh, the, the providers would now get um, a kind of a lump sum and um, the, the care in the outpatient setting would fall into that uh, lump sum. Uh, and the, the notion is that there would be a, that overall payment would be higher than what um, providers are receiving right now in a fee for service model with again there's some nuances based on some of the quality metrics that have been proposed but that's the overall direction and then there would be um, a bonus uh, for patients who have a successful transplant so again the idea here is you're incentivizing the care of patients with more complicated uh, chronic kidney disease who are at risk for progression, progressing potentially to end-stage kidney disease, and then also um, uh, providing financial support or incentivization to help patients get transplanted. And so these are um, changes that are going to impact nephrologists, are gonna impact dialysis units um, nationally. Uh, and here I go into some of the detail about the mandatory model. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, basically uh, honing in on just the mandatory model here and that 50% of the country's nephrologists and units will receive this bonus um, or a reduced payment based on targets. Um, and then uh, this slide uh, details some, some details about the optional models. And what I would say, because it's optional, is that the nephrologists choose to participate or not. So this may have an impact um, uh, for some patients if their nephrologist uh, or their nephrology practice chooses to participate and for others will have less of an impact. 
So the last few minutes, I want to um, reflect on how this impacts you as a patient or, uh, or the caregiver, or I know we have providers on the call as well. How does this impact those patients who are getting dialysis? What is the, what is the overall um, implication of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative? So what I would say is, um, regardless of the optional um, model, whether nephrology practices participate or don't participate, regardless of what happens with the mandatory model, if, if a practice that you go to is part of the randomization or not, I think um, it is fair to say that overall, there will be a shift towards more education of patients before they start dialysis um, about what their options are in terms of home dialysis uh, and, and the various modalities there, whether it's peritoneal dialysis, whether it's home hemodialysis, and finally transplant, that there's more education about transplant, um, even if living donation is not an option, um, more upfront education about um, uh, deceased donor transplant. So more education. Um, I would say there will also be likely more patients on home dialysis and support for patients on home dialysis. So the idea here is based on, um, based on some data that patients who are on home dialysis um, uh, potentially have um, better outcomes during certain periods um, of being on dialysis, um, that there is some support for um, improved quality of life, um, those are some of the factors that have gone into the administration's decision to support home dialysis more. And so, um, again, regardless of what um, the individual practice actually um, does in terms of participation, I think this is the overall direction that having um, some groups participate will move us towards, which is more home dialysis and support and education for those. Um, on home dialysis. Um, we also um, anticipate more um, living donor and deceased organ transplants um, as a result of this, um, both through the financial support or incentivization um, with some of the efforts that are being made to expand um, the pool of transplants, um, supporting our living donors in terms of uh, their expenses, these may all lead to, um, and hopefully will, more uh, transplants over time. And I think, you know, this is, I think this is the last slide, yep. So, and I think, you know, overall, regardless of, um, and you could probably get a sense that there's a lot in the details of this in terms of the models, and there's still a lot that we don't know. Um, the final details of these models have not been uh, released, but at the very least, um, there will be more attention, and there already has been, about kidney disease at, at, at a national level. And that, I think, is a, is a very, um, very productive step forward. Um, and you know, I know we have a lot of advocates on the phone, people who have done advocacy work, um, and you know, National Kidney Foundation, American Society of Nephrology, um, patient groups uh, have, have really uh, try to raise awareness on Capitol Hill and at the White House about kidney disease and make sure that it gets the attention that it needs so that we can move forward in terms of new therapies and improving quality of life. So I think um, the fact that the administration chose to highlight this initiative and, um, and, and bring a lot of attention to kidney disease is a positive step. So that's my last slide. I, I, I want to give thanks to those groups uh, that I'm a part of, the American Society of Nephrology Quality Committee, uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, Kidney Division, the Renal Division, the Depar Brigham Department of Quality and Safety, Partners Population Health, and finally my patients, um, because it's my patients that I see um, and, and um, communicate with on a weekly basis or monthly basis that really motivate this work, that um, highlight uh, the importance of this work, and frankly provide the uh, ideas and, uh, and, and the guidance around what the steps are that should be taken to improve care for this. That's it.
Malika, thank you very much. Uh, that was very informative. Um, you know, you covered a lot in that uh, small amount of time that we gave you. And we also uh, already have a number of questions that are coming through. So I'm just going to jump in and ask you some of these questions from our attendees. Um, so the first question really relates to the fact that um, kidney failure occurs at a much higher proportion amongst uh, African-American patients and minorities. Is there anything in the act that will actively address the racial disparity in terms of patient outcomes in the US? It's a great question and thank you for asking it. And I think it is such an important question right now as we face the COVID pandemic. And we know that uh, COVID-19 has disparately uh, affected patients, um, uh, particularly those of lower socioeconomic status, those who are um, part of uh, historically disadvantaged minority groups. And so it is a question that we need to be asking. I will say that um, there is not specific language in the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative that discusses disparities, but I will say directionally, I think this will help um, improve outcomes um, for patients. Um, as we know, um, we have a, a, a significant population of patients who are African American and Hispanic and Native American. And so improvements in care for all of our kidney patients will, will help these communities. But we at American Society of Nephrology and I know other groups, um, specifically when we gave our feedback, did highlight some of our concerns with potential issues with implementation that could affect these communities in particular. So I think the, the onus is on all of us to um, continue to uh, look closely at what's proposed in the final rule um, and to provide that feedback and to engage this administration or whichever administration um, on these tough issues and make sure that uh, things are um, addressed equitably. Yeah, and I, so thank you for that answer. I mean, I, and I think that's a very important point and one that we as a community, both as physicians and patients and advocates should continue to advocate for, for these changes and, and to continue this work into the next administration, whichever that administration uh, should be. Uh, there's a comment, and you know, I don't know if you'd like to comment on this comment, but uh, it comes from uh, one of the attendees uh, that says that you know, we found uh, home PD to be much better, much easier than clinic HD, but they found out the hard way. And their comment is, you know, shouldn't nephrologists be trained to give these options more clearly and make them more available. As you already stated, in many countries in the United Kingdom where I trained initially, uh, the majority of patients are on peritoneal dialysis and that is not the case in the United States. Yeah, I think, you know, a, a lot of this comes down to how people are trained, frankly, what the practices are of uh, a local area, a local region, um, the comfort level with providing education about peritoneal dialysis, comfort level, among nephrologists, uh, particularly trainees, about providing peritoneal dialysis care. And it can be kind of a self-sustaining cycle if you train at a place that doesn't have a lot of peritoneal dialysis and mostly hemodialysis. And then uh, you educate your patients or you try to educate them, but you provide more information about in-center hemodialysis because that's what you know, then, then decision-making by patients can, can be affected by that. And so that's why I think this is, this is a good step forward in terms of getting a focus on uh, home modalities and making sure that there is um, support, um, both financially um, and otherwise, for educating um, patients about home modalities and also potentially for clinics to think about what their infrastructure is and providers think about what their infrastructure is to support patients on home dialysis. Now in many areas, it is, it is easier to start somebody on in center HD. The this, this system is set up for that. And so this helps provide some of the uh, financial support to help um, deal with that. Thank you. So there are a couple of questions about transplant and I'm going to briefly address them if, you're, if it's okay with you, Monica. Okay. Um, so uh, there's one question about where are all these kid, new kidneys going to come from for transplants? Well, you know, uh, as Dr. Bendu had uh, suggested, um, there's going to be some encouragement uh, to increase the number of living donors. Uh, and that's certainly uh, going to be part of this. 
Uh, secondly, I mean, something that people don't necessarily realize, but up to 25% of deceased donors uh, are not used. Now, in many cases, that's because of the concern of the quality of the deceased donor kidney. But um, there are ways that those kidneys could be utilized uh, so that they'd still be useful to some patients because there are often patients who would have to wait longer on, on uh, dialysis. Um, and so even getting a lesser quality deceased donor kidney would be beneficial to them. So those are also things that are going to be addressed. Uh, those are, it's one of the pressing questions. We in the American Society of Transplantation have been very concerned about this and are looking at ways to support uh, the CMMI Act, the, the Kidney Health Initiative, uh, to address that question. And a related uh, question was, what is the best way to find a kidney donor? And I think that you know, uh, speaks to this issue of increasing living donation. Um, most transplant centers will give you some guidance. Certainly we at the Brigham uh, are willing to talk to any of our potential uh, weightless patients about ways that uh, uh, they could think about this. And so I think you know, if you contact your actual center, uh, they, they should be able to give you some guidance. Now we're right at 350. There is one more question I was going to ask you. I'm not sure if you have uh, an answer to this, but there's a question about services provided to incarcerated people. Is there anything that is going to change in terms in terms of that? Because I think you know people who are uh, you know socially deprived or excluded from mainstream society often have a great deal of difficulty in getting services. I think the same could be said for those who, who don't have uh, you know, legal status as immigrants. It's a great question. Um, it is not addressed in the body of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, um, but it's a, it's a really important question and it's something that we as a society need to go back to CMS and get more information about um, those who are incarcerated, those who um, are undocumented, um, I think um, what we've tried to do is, is take incremental steps um, and try to advance things in a way that is um, overall meaningful and um, will improve the quality of care for all kidney patients. But these are very important um, issues that, that can't be overlooked and need to be top of mind and need to be addressed. Thank you, Malika, and thank you for staying on time. <laughs> it's always wonderful, you know, when you do these programs that uh, we're able to, to make sure that people uh, uh, get the opportunity to speak and so forth. So again, thank you very much for joining. I think that was very informative. And, you know, if people have questions, please send them in and uh, we will try and, and get you answers to those directly as well. Great, so moving on um, to our next speaker. So in keeping with the theme um, of this uh, meeting, uh, we're going to have uh, Stephanie Wallace, uh, who is a perinatal nurse uh, trainer, uh, a perinatal dialysis nurse trainer, and she works for US Renal Care and works with uh, some of our uh, dialysis attendings, um, Emily Robinson and Lili Zhao, uh, amongst others, and help train patients on peritoneal dialysis. And she's going to uh, talk uh, about you know, peritoneal dialysis, how that might be an option for some patients and, and what it involves. So uh, thank you very much for agreeing to do this, Stephanie, um, and uh, over to you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I am here today to talk a little about peritoneal dialysis to everybody. Um, peritoneal dialysis is a great home modality um, between peritoneal dialysis and home hemo. Either modality to be home is fantastic, uh, but peritoneal dialysis is, is a great option. Um, basically, uh, what peritoneal dialysis is, is you know, with dialysis, we need a filter um, to clean uh, the extra waste and the extra fluid from your body. Um, and with peritoneal dialysis, we use what's called your peritoneal membrane or the peritoneum um, as the filter. So we use your own body's membrane. Um, tends to make peritoneal dialysis a little bit more gentler, um, where some patients will have side effects from, excuse me, hemodialysis. Um, with PD, usually we minimize that because we're doing it daily, so it's, it's a natural, more natural, like your um, natural kidney function. 
and PD is performed primarily at home. Um, we're hoping to get more and more um, patients on PD at home. Um, how does it work? Um, like I said, what uses your membrane, the lining in your abdomen as the filter. Um, we place the solution. Um, it's a dextrose or glucose solution that we place in, internally into your membrane, and we let that dwell or we let it stay there for several hours. Um, that's what I kind of call the magic time. Uh, that's when the dialysis is happening, when that solution is dwelling in your belly. It's acting like a magnet. It's pulling the extra fluid um, and the extra waste from your body into that solution, and then we drain it out. Um, if you notice there in the picture, it shows the solution going in, looking clear. Um, and when we drain it, it does look yellowed. It's very similar to urine. It has that urea in there that will make it similar to urine. Um, this screen here is just basically how um, the dialysis is happening. It's showing you, you know, the blood component side, which is um, the peritoneal lining is just very vascular, filled with capillaries. Um, so the blood um, access there is fantastic. Um, so through the peritoneal membrane, when we put that solution in, it'll pull the waste and the fluid to it, like I said, um, like a magnet. <clears throat> so um, to have PD performed, you do need to have um, access for that solution to get into your belly. Um, so we do have a catheter or a PD catheter surgically placed um, into the wall of your abdomen. It is a permanent access. It stays with you for as long as you're doing peritoneal dialysis. Um, you know, the, the surgeons um, will measure, you know, a good place to put it, but it is usually um, below your belt line and usually to one side or the other. Um, the catheter itself is about four to six inches, um, and then we do attach an extension to that um, that will allow you to connect to whatever um, uh, company. You, there's two major companies for PD solution, and, and you know, it will allow you to connect to their solutions. <clears throat> um, oh, sorry, let me back up one second. One thing about the catheter, um, when they do get it placed, um, it is a day surgery, so you're in and out the same day. Um, you know, it's a two-week healing period to be fully healed, you know, to start with the full fills, and training is usually done all along that time. Um, but the one thing with the catheter is um, we ask patients not to swim in lakes or ponds, um, and the reason for that is that you never really know what's in that water, and we don't want to introduce anything like that into your belly and, you know, create some sort of infection. Um, but swimming in a chlorinated pool or the ocean is okay as long as and as well as bathing and showering um so there's two types of pd um one is the ambulatory which is the manual way um so that's done by gravity um, you can see this gentleman here um the fill bag is hanging and that will flow into his belly he'll let it dwell in there for um you know, usually we do a dwell time between three and four hours um, but that's to be determined um and like it says here capd has been in use for a long time, um, more than 30 years. And, and I know Malika, uh, Dr. Mendu had mentioned, you know, the countries that are, you know, are doing a lot of PD, um, but it's an easier modality. You know, you don't need to go to a clinic. Um, you know, you don't really need uh, electricity necessarily. You know, we just need to be clean because um, the main thing we worry about is infection control and preventing any infection or peritonitis. Um, so how you perform a uh, PD exchange, um, you know, and the nurses at the clinic train, you know, how you connect. Um, but the first step is to always drain. You know, we like to drain out anything that's been in there or any residual from a prior exchange. Um, and then we fill up the abdomen. That's when the dwell time happens. And during the dwell phase, um, you're free to move around. You know, you can go to the store. Uh, you know, you can go to church or, you know, wherever you may need to go. Um, you're not stuck at home during that dwell time, um, but you just do need to time it so you come back and and get your exchange um, drain done in the next exchange. Um, so where and when can you perform CAPD exchanges? Um, usually the manuals are done during the day. Um, an exchange takes about 30 minutes. And what an exchange entails is a fill and a drain, um, or sorry, a drain and a fill. Um, the number of ex exchanges is determined by the nephrologist. Um, I notice more and more now we're doing more of what's called intermittent. Um, so some patients might be not be getting a full four exchanges during the day, you know, um, we'll test their residual function um, and see how much, um, you know, we need to do. Um, exchanges can be performed in any clean area. Um, the, what makes a clean area is, of course, dust-free and, 
um, you know, clean surfaces. Um, we do ask you to shut windows and shut any fans off, you know, just to minimize any um, activity in the air. Uh, but they can be done mostly at home. I have had patients do them at work. Um, vacation is fantastic. You can travel. Um, traveling is very easy, um, you know, especially if you're just going on a road trip. You just throw in, um, you know, what you need for your solution in the car and off you go. Um, you know, if you wanted to travel uh, a longer distance, um, you know, I do have a patient that um, goes on a cruise every year and she just brings her machine with her and all the solution is waiting in her, her cabin when she gets on the boat. Um, so scheduling travel is, is very simple. It's just, you know, they need a lead notice and, and uh, getting patients to travel is a good part of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the other part, um, like I said, there's two types of PD, um, the manual way, which I just explained, and then we have what's called the cycler or you use a machine at your bedside. Um, the machine is usually done at night while you're sleeping. Um, and what it does is it will do those exchanges for you while you're sleeping. It will perform the, the fill, it will count down the dwell, and then it will drain you out for as many, pro, as many cycles as we have it programmed. Um, and that is performed while you're sleeping. And, and like it says here in the morning, you detach from the tubing. Um, most patients, when they do the cycler at night, that's it for the day, you know, so then their days are free. And they're, um, you know, they're not consumed by, you know, doing the manual exchanges. Um, so if you decide um, to, to learn about peritoneal dialysis, um, during the training, you learn how to perform their exchange safely. Like I said, infection uh, prevention is the main, um, you know, goal that we go for. We don't want any infection in your belly or in your exit site or anywhere. Um, you'll learn to measure your blood pressure check your weight, evaluate your fluid, you know, whether you maybe have some swelling or, you know, maybe not, maybe you feel dry and you feel dehydrated. Um, how to care for your exit site and your catheter, which I touched on briefly. Um, understanding your diet and your medication. Um, at the clinic, we also have dietitians there that, um, you know, monitor your labs and, you know, give you suggestions for your diet. Uh, with PD, oftentimes um, your diet is a lot more liberal. Because you're doing dialysis every day, you're allowed, you're allowed that kind of freedom to be a little bit more liberal with your diet. And like I said, the big, big main thing that we want to avoid is signs of um, any infection. So we really want to evaluate signs and symptoms of that, you know, and reach out to your nurse if you ever question any of those. Um, as far as follow-up care, you know, once you're trained in home on PD, um, usually patients are seen monthly. I, right now during COVID, everything is different. Um, but I am at least seeing my patients monthly um, for lab work, but we like to see you monthly for lab work. Um, and then also um, my patients currently, I see them twice a month. So I'll see them um, in the beginning of the month for lab work and then towards the end of the month for their, um, you know, care visit at the clinic. Um, you know, they'll see the physician, the nurse, the dietitian, and also the social worker. Um, the home visits, home visits are done Ideally, they're done prior to anybody deciding they want to do PD, so they can kind of have the um, expectations of what it entails. Um, but home visits are done, um, you know, when patients are initially trained and you're starting at home, and then they are done annually um, from there. Um, as far as phone calls, um, all programs have nurses that are on call, um, so someone's always available for you, um, you know, if you had any issues arise um, while you're at home. And this last screen here um, just kind of base, basically goes about the advantages and disadvantages. Um, so like the advantages of controlling your dialysis schedule, it's all on your time. Um, you know, you, you do it when it works for you, um, you know, fits to a flexible lifestyle, promotes more independence. Um, patients tend to have more energy and feel better, but they're doing dialysis every day. They're getting that waste and the toxins cleared out of their body regularly. Um, you don't have to travel to the dialysis unit for treatment. Um, right now, that's a, a, a good topic with, um, with all the COVID. You know, my patients are able to stay at home, um, you know, and just able to come in just once a month, you know, so it's minimizing that. Um, involved in your own care, providing continuous therapy, like I said, more like your natural kidney function. Um, no needles or blood for the dialysis. Um, it's all done through your belly, through flowing that solution in and out. Um, we do do monthly labs, so I often tell patients this, and I'll tell them these, and they said, you said no needles, but we do draw labs once a month. Um, the dietitian has more flexibility in adjusting your diet. Um, you may require a few medications. Um, the cycler can be done at night while you're sleeping. 
It's portable and easy for travel. And no partner is required for PD. Um, I have plenty of patients that live alone um, and they do their therapy on their own. Um, and as far as disadvantages, um, you know, we talk about going to, um, doing it seven days a week, which does, you know, sometimes um, it becomes part of your daily routine. Uh, requirement for the permanent catheter, I said that's a day surgery, gets put in uh, two weeks for a heal. Uh, we worry about the risk of infection. Um, this comment here about may gain weight or have a larger waistline, um, I don't see that too often, but it is a sugar-based solution, so you are getting a little bit extra calories from that. But usually the larger waistline kind of comes from the fills. You know, we kind of stretch those um, muscles out a little bit to accommodate those. Um, training is needed to perform the treatment, and that is done at the clinic with the nurses. Um, you do need space in your home for supplies, um, and the equipment supplies are delivered on a monthly basis. Um, and that's all on you. You know, once you're home and you're trained, you order just what you need. So we try to not overwhelm you with supplies, but there is um, some space that is going to be needed for the supplies at home. Um, and lastly, I just have there um, to be committed to self-care. Um, you know, patients, um, I've been finding more and more, we're doing a lot more options to patients before they're hitting uh, chemodialysis. So that's fantastic because we're getting them on PD. Um, while they still have a lot of that residual function and a lot of, you know, it really just helps the process along. And PD preserves your residual function for longer, um, you know, so we want to maintain that for, you know, as long as we can. Um, and I think that's it for me. I can clear this up here. There we go. And I'm back. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, so um, I'm going to start with a few questions. Are there patients that you think would not be suitable for PD that you can think of that might not, that might have a hard time? Um, you know, I really evaluate them when I meet them. Um, you know, I do have some patients that family members will perform, you know, the PD for their parents or maybe their spouse. Um, but you, knew, you do need to have some manual dexterity. Um, you know, vision, you know, good vision is important because we want to be making those clean connections. Um, but I've been finding more and more, um, even like, you know, people with prior abdominal surgeries and things like that aren't really getting ruled out like they used to. Um, you know, we're getting catheters put in them, getting them trained and getting them home on PD. Yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned that the, uh, the main side effect uh, was infections, was the, the, the biggest complication rate. Now, I remember years ago, years and years and years ago, when I started... <laughs> uh, working with PD patients uh, about 30 years ago, actually, um, the rate of infections was pretty high. It'd be, you know, pretty typical for patients to get two uh, infections a year. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Is, is, that, is that your experience? And how often, yeah. is, how often uh, do patients get infections and uh, how are they treated? How easy is it to treat them? Um, I would like to say never, um, but we do have patients that unfortunately sometimes, you know, will get infections. Um, but I think a lot of it now is training, you know, um, just that constant reinforcement about clean connections. And if you have a contamination, letting your nurse know, um, and you ask, asked about um, treatment and treatment for a peritonitis um, is easily enough that we instill the antibiotics in the dialysis solution. And then we instill that in the belly, and then that will work, uh, you know, and treat the infection internally or intraperitoneal, intraperitoneal. Okay, so we have a couple of questions uh, about weight gain. And, you know, what do you typically see in terms of weight gain uh, for patients who are on peritoneal dialysis? Because no. this is glucose solution. And, you know, particularly for patients who are diabetic, and a lot of our patients are diabetic, does it make it harder to control the diabetes? And how much weight, weight gain does a patient normally experience? You know, I don't often see too much weight gain, um, but as far as diabetics uh, with their blood sugars, um, often um, it just will take a little adjustment with their insulin if they're on insulin or medication. Um, ideally, um, with patients um, with diabetes, the cycler is, is ideal because that, that's treatment during the night. You know, they wouldn't be ingesting any extra sugars or calories or things like that, so it's, it's sometimes easier to adjust. But I haven't had too much of an issue. Uh, mostly it's just a, a slight adjustment with medication. And as far as weight gain, like I said, I haven't really seen it. I have said, I have had some of my younger, thinner women 
patients will say their belly feels a little puffy, but I just attribute that to the fills. You know, we are filling their belly up with some solution, um, you know, to accommodate. It's not usually there, you know, so it does, it, sometimes they feel a little pudgy, they'll say. All right. And um, so we have a question here. How long does your peritoneum last? So how, how long do you see patients, you know, how many years do they go on average? Do some patients go shorter? What's the longest time that you've seen a patient on peritoneal down? Yeah, they, um, you know, I have heard that the average life of the peritoneum could anywhere be from five to seven years before it exhausts and just kind of doesn't do the filtering like we need. Um, currently, right now, I've had a patient that's been on six years. Um, I've heard of other patients that have been on longer, but not um, anybody personally that I know. Uh, but the fortunate thing that I have is that, I, uh, you know, I have a lot of patients that might be on PD for a year or two, and then they get their transplant and, the, you know, they move on that way, you know. But um, as far as exhausting, I would say about, you know, they say five to seven years. But we do measure every three months, um, we'll measure adequacy. You know, how well of a job are we doing with PD? Are we giving you enough dialysis? You know, and as those numbers drop, um, you know, we do adjust to more dialysis. Um, oftentimes, it, it, it might get to the point where it's too much. You know, patients just feel like it's too much, so they might opt to, you know, choose another modality. And, and how common is it for patients to switch between the manual exchanges and the machine these days? Because, you know, again, when I was doing this many years ago, it, we didn't have, uh, you know, uh, the machine dialysis is all uh, manual exchanges. I mean, I, I guess that's pretty uncommon these days. Yeah, no, you, I mean, really, honestly, I have patients that might even do a combination of the two, or, you know, they want a break from the cycler and they'll do their manuals during the day. So it's kind of an interchangeable um, thing. We really offer, um, you know, we want to make it easiest for the patient. What works best for them? How does it work best for them? You know, I have had a few patients that, you know, sleeping on the, you know, with the machine on the cycler at night, you know, they didn't like sleeping all night. So, you know, after dinner, They'll hook up and do a fill, and then, you know, then they have a little bit ahead of the game before they go to bed kind of thing. So I have people do all sorts of different combinations um, to make it work for them. And uh, how much space does a patient normally need to store their bags and other? Um, they, you usually get about 25 to 30 boxes, um, and I usually tell patients, you know, maybe like about four, you know, four to five feet like square area, a lot of patients will just pick a wall and stack them up. Or a nice, if you have a nice closet, that helps too. <laughs> and um, uh, so let me just, I'm just reading through some of the other questions. Um, and now how, how long does a training generally take? How long is it before a patient becomes competent? And in terms of family members, do you often train more than one family member? And how many can get trained or? How does that work? You know, during the training session, um, you know, once we're out of this pandemic, um, I'm, I'm more than happy as many people that would like to come in to learn, um, to learn. I have trained, you know, um, many siblings of parents that are receiving dialysis. Um, so as far as training, we'll train whoever, um, you know, is interested. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the other part of your question. Um, oh, um, how long does it take? Long to get trained. Oh, training. Um, training, you know, ideally, if we can get somebody in five days a week, um, you know, maybe two weeks. Um, it's depending on pe people's schedules. Um, but they say about 10 training sessions. But that doesn't mean that, you know, longer is bad. You know, um, we can train for as long as till patient feels comfortable enough to go home and perform it independently. And, and how far from the dialysis unit does the is it okay for the patient to live because it's a home modality? So once they're trained, I guess you're not seeing them very often. Is that ever been an issue in terms of how does that work? Um, no, that? not so much. I mean, we're fortunate around here that, you know, we have a lot of clinics around. Um, I have heard on other parts of the country, like out in kind of like the Indian territory out in Nevada, they drive hundreds of miles. Um, but, you know, it would just, you know, and for those patients, we would see them once a month. But we do like to see them at least monthly. You know, so we can get some lab work, check in, how are things going, check on supplies, um, you know, check in with the doctor and that kind of thing. So distance would be, you know, as far as, far as they wouldn't mind traveling, you know, at least monthly. All right, great. So I'm, I know I've been peppering you with questions. I'm going to ask you one last question. That's fine. No problem. 
um, is, uh, is there an age requirement uh, in terms of PD? Do younger patients do better? Do older patients do okay? What is, the, what is your experience with adequacy and age and so on? Um, I think, um, depending on the younger patient, um, you know, how well they've accepted the disease process. I had to have some patients, you know, the younger patients that are kind of in denial, um, you know, and they don't, you know, you kind of worry about them doing what they want to at home, but definitely trainable. That's the nice thing with the new cycler um, is that it's all automated. So like I can log in the next day and see the treatment from the night before. Um, so that monitoring is good um, for that. So older patients, um, you know, with them, you know, we worry about vision, you know, is their vision okay to make connections? Um, you know, are they strong enough? Because the, the cycler bags could weigh up to about 12 pounds, you know, so can they lift that bag? Um, but as far as outcomes, um, I think the best is just getting someone straight out, you know, get right to PD, right off the bat, while they have the most residual function that they have, and we can preserve that as long as we can. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I just thought of one more question that I would like to ask. Yeah, it is, absolutely. <laughs> Do, um, and, uh, are there different types of PD machines, this is for the audience, and do some patients do better on one type versus a, another type, and is it easy to change between different types of machines? Um, so right now, um, we, the comp U.S. Renal Care, the company I work for, we use Baxter products, um, and Baxter's machine is the Amia Cycler. Excuse me, that's the newer cycler they have, and it's great. It's, um, it, it, it talks to you, you know, it, it's all on-screen troubleshooting. Um, like I said, I have the capability to look the very next day to, to see what might have happened that night if they had some troubles or whatever it may be. Um, but that's the primary machine that I use right now. Um, I do know Fresenius has a machine called the Liberty, um, and that's a similar machine, uh, but that's, you know, I'm not as familiar with the use of that one. I do know that the Amia is the first one that has this interactive uh, mode that the patient, there's no record keeping really for the patient on their end. They input their, you know, their weight, their blood pressure, all their vitals, and everything gets imported through the, the modem that's attached for the share source system. So uh, when we had the old machine, uh, we weren't real keen on training everybody right away on the new one, but I trained plenty of patients on a new machine and it went fine. So I would, I would recommend if you could stay on one, that would be your best bet, but if you had to switch, it's easy to learn. Great. With that, Stephanie, I am going to thank you so much for your patience and answering all of those questions. Uh, so, oh, no problem at all. So beautifully. And I think we're going to move on. We're a little ahead of time, but that's actually wonderful uh, to, all right. to the last speaker. Again, thank you very much. Uh, as all right. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So, um, so with that, we're going to move on to our, our last speaker, and it's really my great pleasure to introduce uh, Vanessa Evans. Uh, Vanessa uh, is a uh, patient herself, uh, but she also works as a patient advocate manager uh, for Next Stage. And in keeping with the theme um, of today's program, we're going, she's going to talk about uh, home hemodialysis, how do you do it, what does it look like, what are the options, uh, et cetera. So I'm going to mute myself and allow Vanessa to take over the screen. Hello, can everybody hear me? I hope that everyone can hear me. It looks like my camera is uh, not working yet. Hopefully it is and everybody can hear me okay. Okay, so I can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I hope you can see me too. Um, so what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about my own experience. I am a kidney dialysis patient. I've been a home dialysis patient actually now for 14 years, but I've been a kidney dialysis patient for 22 years. So uh, quite a long time, a uh, lot of experience to share with you. And I want to talk today a little bit about why more frequent home dialysis could be a benefit to you. And here I am, I had to actually open up my screen. So here I am. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about that. And so full disclosure, I uh, do work for Fresenius Kidneys, North America. I'm the patient advocate manager, but more importantly, I am a dialysis patient. And just sharing my story a little bit about why more frequent dialysis is important. So my story began way back when I was probably maybe 16 years old. 
I found out that my kidneys weren't working really just from doing simple blood tests that people do every year when you go to school or you go to camp. And what they found out is that I had very low iron. And so I was given iron pills to hope get my iron back up. But what they found out is that my iron stores actually never did get back up. And so basically among more research, I was told to do a kidney biopsy and, and find out maybe if there was something going wrong with my kidney. And so I did find out at a very young age, probably about 16 years old, that I did have kidney failure. I was in ESRD and I was going to need a kidney transplant. And at 16 years old, you know, I really wasn't thinking too much about it. I kind of just thought, oh, I'm just going to have a transplant and life is going to go on as usual. And I didn't really understand what that meant and how this kidney illness, if you will, was going to be with me the rest of my life and is with me the rest of my life, right? And so I was very young and very naive and we're very lucky that we're doing what we're doing right now because in, in that day and age, there were no webinars, there were no brochures, there were no advocates, there was literally nobody that I could speak to. So I just thought, okay, I'm going to do my transplant and I'm going to move on. And so uh, the reason I thought that is because my mom was a compatible donor. And so I did have a kidney transplant actually back in 1991. So you guys can do the math because you know, to know basically how old I am too. Um, it was right when I graduated high school. And that transplant lasted me just about five and a half years. It was long enough for me to go away to college um, and to do a study abroad and do all the things that, you know, normal everyday people do. But then basically, once I graduated college and I started my first job, my transplant was then starting to fail. And I really was feeling a lot of the symptoms that I think you guys can relate to. Um, my blood pressure was really high. I had no energy. I always felt kind of puffy and bloated. And, you know, some days were better than others. But really, in general, I just was not, not feeling well. And so at that point, um, there was no more, you know, being able to try to save that transplant. We kind of had done everything that we could. And so I had to start thinking about dialysis. And unlike, again, what we're doing right now, um, I just was told that I would go in center. And so that's what I did. I went in center. Um, I had a fistula placed. And for eight years, I did dialysis in center. And for anybody that is on the call right now that goes in center, I think you know what the in center experience feels like, right? So I would put out my arm. I would let the nurses and the techs put the, the needles in. I wouldn't look at it. Um, really, the only part that I actually did is I asked them to turn the machine towards me so I could basically count down the hours, right? How much longer until I had to sit in this chair that I could get out. And, and part of the way I felt was also really, you know, interfering with just my clinical well-being. I was on blood pressure medications. Um, after my dialysis treatment, I was exhausted. My recovery was like 24 hours. Um, you know, I really didn't have energy and I basically had to revolve my life around dialysis. Um, and, and that really was difficult. I was a young woman at that time, just graduating college, starting my first job, lived with a bunch of roommates, you know, in the prime of my life, and then dialysis started. And so I had to quit my job. And then that meant that I didn't have any money. So I couldn't live with my roommates. So I had to move back in with my parents. And really, in general, I was just feeling depressed. I was feeling overwhelmed and really tired, right? Um, not really know how this was going to go, but always determined to move forward. And so I had a very supportive family, um, especially my mom. She always made me volunteer and try to better myself. And so part of that volunteering is I speak Spanish fluently. And so I volunteered at a non-for-profit um, to help the Hispanic community. That in turn led to me starting to teach part-time Spanish. And so I kind of did move along. And eight years, fast forward kind of eight years, um, I had met my husband, we had just gotten married. And you know he doesn't know me other than being a dialysis patient in center. And we decided that we were going to start a family. 
And so uh, I could probably do a whole other, you know, webinar even just on the, our, our surrogacy journey, but we looked into surrogacy and, and that's ended how we ended up having our kids. And when my first child was born, I just felt like, you know, I really felt bad. I felt like I was missing everything. I waited years to, to get married, um, years to have a child. And then when my first son was born, it didn't matter that he was born on a Sunday. Monday, I had to go to dialysis. And it didn't matter that I did well and I was, you know, a very compliant patient. I watched what I ate and what I drank. I still was on all these medications, felt horrible. And so when I'd come home from dialysis, you know, to play with him, to hold him, to just be a mother, something that we probably take for granted, was honestly too much. It was just a lot for me. And so he was really my motivation, if you will, to start looking at different ways. And, and people ask me, well, Vanessa, how did you find out about home dialysis? And, and honestly, in, in that day and age, I think I went online and I typed in home dialysis and I looked to see you know, what I could find. And I found out about home hemodialysis and it appealed to me because I already had a fistula place. So for me, it wasn't an extra surgery. And in relatively speaking, I did you know, really well on dialysis, but I wanted to see if I could find a way to be able to do it at home. And so I started to research and I, I want to just say that, you know, it really took me a long time to make the transition from in center to home, because like most of you out there that are maybe thinking about this, I was really scared. Again, I for a year put my arm out, I would let other people put needles in, I turned the other way and I thought, oh my God, you know, how am I going to be able to do this at home? What if there's an emergency? What if I can't put the needle in? Where are my supplies gonna go? What does the machine look like? All of those questions, you know, I really thought about. And so today, part of what I'd like to do is show you and talk to you about the other half, right? Why more frequent is so important and what I've learned that I hope that I can teach all of you today, as well as I'm gonna show you my machine. The nice thing about doing these virtual things is I, I can actually show you my machine here at home. So that's part of what I wanna do and I hope we can have a little bit of a interactive discussion. So what you see here in this first slide is, you know, just pictures of my family. Why did I wanna go home? It was really first for my family and really because I wanted to get back to living what we all call quote, a normal everyday life. And what I found, and I found this to be true, is that, you know what? When you do more frequent dialysis, you actually have a lot of clinical benefits. And I was one of those patients that thought, my God, I hate coming here three days a week. Why would I ever wanna now do five, six days a week? Well, the truth is when you're doing three days a week, it really is not doing the the work that your kidney actually can do. You know, your kidney works seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So trying to do it kind of on a three day a week schedule, although it does maintain you, it doesn't really let you thrive and feel really good. So you can see here in this slide, you know, some of the clinical benefits and I am a testament to those benefits because here I am 22 years, you know, going strong on home dialysis and you know, I don't intend on stopping, right? There's improved survival, there's ability to travel. I'm gonna to talk to you about all the places I've gone. Um, that post-recovery time is really, um, it really is much better. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, before, like I said, I used to take like 24 hours to recover. And now sometimes I do my treatment and when I'm done, I just get up and go for a walk or do whatever I feel like doing. I definitely have more energy, uh, vitality. I um, Improved appetite. I think I'm, you know, a, a testament to the coronavirus right now. I think I've gained like, you know, the Corona 20. Um, but just in general, I feel better. I sleep better. And one of the interesting things that happened is the first three days that I started doing home hemodialysis more frequently, I actually was able to get off all my blood pressure pills. So that was really great for me. Not only was I able to feel better, but I also was able to get off those medications and that does two things. Yes, you feel better, but number two, there's a monetary piece that goes with that, right? Because we usually have like co-pays that you have to pay 
And so by getting off those blood pressure pills, that reduced some of the monetary funds that I had to do on a monthly basis. And the most important is I have control now. There's no more Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three o'clock was my time. I can do my schedule around what works for me, you know, and I work full time. I have two kids. They're now actually uh, 13 and 15. And really I'm allowed to schedule my treatments as long as I'm following my prescription. And you obviously need to be able to follow your prescription that your healthcare provider gives you. But as long as I'm following my prescription, you know, I am really able to control when and how I do that. And there's a lot of different kinds of prescriptions that you can talk to your doctor about, right? So um, the, the machine that I use, the Next Stage machine is actually FDA approved that you do not need a care partner. Um, you would have to speak with your healthcare provider and see if that's something that you would be able to do to do solo or independent dialysis. But it also is approved to do it nocturnally at night while you sleep. So if you do have a care partner, because you do need a care partner for that, um, you can do it at night while you're asleep. And so there's a lot of options, kind of the way um, we were talking a little bit before about PD and your different options. There's also a lot of options with HHG. And what this just shows you, friends, is that home dialysis really allows a lot of flexibility and you can work with your healthcare team to see what's right for you, right? And so when we talk a little bit about that, and I alluded to this before, so I talked about my recovery time. So before when I was in center and I was working part-time as a Spanish teacher at a local high school, I used to think about when I would do my treatment and how I could plan my curriculum because I knew that if I did my treatment, you know, the next day I might be tired because it would take me so long to recover. And what I didn't know, and I found out more as I've been doing home dialysis now for these past couple of years, is that you know the recovery time and the why it matters, they actually correlate. And if you look at this slide, when you're in center, um, sometimes it can take you on average eight hours to recover. When you're doing it more frequently, you know they say about one hour, I think in my case, sometimes it's not even that. But even more importantly, when you're talking about why does this matter, it's because it's an increase of risk. So if you look again here, it's 22% increase of risk um, of death when the recovery is between seven to 12 hours. And that number actually goes up to 47% increased risk of death if the recovery is over 12 hours. So guys, think about when you are at dialysis and what your recovery time looks like. I know it's scary to bring this home, but I also think that you wanna do what's best for, for your life and your, your livelihood and thinking about some of the recovery time and some of these statistics, um, I think you know, really makes you think about kind of taking that step and thinking about it, right? Because my recovery time is basically null, um, I have gone back to work full time. So as I stated before, I work full time at, at Fresenius. Um, but you know what? I also work full time as a mom. I should probably add a slide here as a full time mother. And more importantly, uh, I have another little side gig right now that just finished. I actually have a side business um, for Spanish immersion. And I have two teachers that work for me that teach Spanish in schools. And I would have never been able to manage all of this, I think, if I was still doing in center because I was pretty tired after my treatments. Um, there was a lot going on for me and I really didn't feel like I had control of just my everyday life. And I, I really do feel like I was able to regain that control and really be able to do what's right for me and kind of live a quote unquote normal life plus I do dialysis and I, I usually do it, you know, in the evenings that that seems to work out for me. One of the things that I wanted to also call attention upon is the significance of the cardiovascular benefits when you do home dialysis. You know, I, I did not understand this from the beginning and I continue to learn and grow every day as a dialysis patient. There is something to be said about doing more frequent dialysis and its role in your cardiovascular health. So when you are doing dialysis three days a week, you know, you are trying 
in, in those three days to pull those fluids off in a kind of a short amount of time, even though we know it doesn't seem short to us. I mean, treatments can be anywhere from three to six hours each time, but you're pulling off all those treatments and those shift of fluids sometimes um, can be difficult for your heart, right? And so what you can find is that a lot of times dialysis patients, and I think the doctors alluded to this in the beginning, the longer that you're on dialysis, um, the more likely that you are to have cardiovascular implications or cardiovascular hospitalizations. And so being kind of a long time dialysis patient, I really wanted to find a way that I could help control this and stay healthy. And knock on wood, you know, I, I do a, a stress test every year um, and my cardiovascular health has looked you know, significantly well, I mean, um, for doing dialysis 22 years. And I, I do attribute a lot of that to doing more frequent and not having that shift of fluids and not, you know, having my blood flow so high that it, it wreaks havoc kind of on the heart. So when you think of this slide, it really shows how an improvement may, may be for you um, if you do it five or six days a week, kind of over a 12 month period. And that's really important because I, I, I want to be here for the long haul and I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I am. One of the things that I really love is not only the control that I get, but the flexibility that, that I have. And um, just like PD, HHD is also something that is portable and that you are able to take with you when you travel. And so I am able to pack up my machine. I'm able to uh, check it in when I go, like if I'm going on a plane, I put it on a hard case and I call the airline beforehand. I let them know that I'm traveling with life-saving dialysis equipment. They usually will mark it in my reservation. It does travel for free because it is life-saving medical equipment. Um, I'm not gonna pretend that you know, it's all easy breezy. It takes planning, it takes organization. You have to allow yourself time to get there and do everything, but I don't let it from, you know, stopping me. I still, when it wasn't COVID-19, I still would take that machine with me everywhere. Um, I've taken it all over the United States. We've done family trips. We have family in Florida. Um, we have family in North Carolina. Um, you know, when we go to the Cape in the summer and I can actually, for that, I can just pack it in the car. There's a soft case that I can pack it with and I've even taken it abroad. So I haven't let it stop me and, and I think patients should be able to travel and doing it accordingly with their healthcare team and planning appropriately. Just like PD, your supplies will be shipped to wherever your destination is. So you have to bring your machine and you have to bring your ancillary supplies. So I bring my needles, my gauze, tape, whatever I need, but whatever is needed for my machine, those things are shipped ahead of time. And so I know that I can call up my destination, make sure that everything's there, and I can travel peacefully knowing that, my, that all my equipment is there. So that has been you know, really helpful for me. Um, I'm really significant because I love to travel and I feel like I got my life back by being normal. Another thing that I like about it is I can do my treatment in the morning wherever I am in a hotel room, however that is, and then I can go about my day. Or if we're doing something during the morning, um, I can do my treatment in the evening. So as long as I'm getting my treatments done and I'm doing my days and times, it doesn't matter you know, how I work it out. And so that's been, that's been really nice. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the components of what a home chemo machine will have. And then I'm gonna show you my machine and I hope you guys will bear with me while I change my video in a minute from me to actually the machine where I can do maybe a little demo to just show you what's involved. So what you'll see first is this is the cycler. This is the Versi cycler. It's the newest cycler. It's a touch screen cycler. Um, the one I have at home is not the touch screen, but it's all the same type of um, cycler and HHD would be used the same way. So what's nice is that it's, again, just like the one that I use, it's portable and you can dialyze when you want, where you want. There is 24 hours, seven days a week, technical support. So not only do you have support from your nurse, 
um, as stated before, but you actually also have IT and technical support to help you with the machine should you need it. The next piece that I want to show you is the pure flow. And the pure flow is where you would make your dialysate. So dialysate is basically your medicine that you use that is um, helping clean your blood. And so they're simple plumbing solutions. Um, you don't need any separate RO system. You don't need a separate sink. You can actually just use an adapter. Um, and so when you're making your dialysate, you would put the adapter in. And then when your dialysate is made, you can you know, just pull the dialysate from the sink. So that's nice. You don't need a dedicated sink and you don't need um, you know, any dedicated plumbing. And the, the clinics will come out to your home to help figure out where is the best place and help you do all those modifications should you need any. Um, the third is the cartridge and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. The cartridge is nice because it's, it's all one piece. It's simple, um, you, there is you know, basically easy um, to use. You just kind of put it in the machine and take it out. And then when you're done, you can wrap it up and throw it away so it's disposable and it's kind of all pre-done for you. So remember, I am not a uh, dialysis tech or nurse. Um, I have no experience doing any of that. So you know, I basically feel like if I can do it, my, my young kids now actually probably know how to do this. I just, watching me. And then lastly, um, similar to PD, um, there, are, there is a what they call Next to Me Connected Health, which is a tablet where all your flow sheets, so if, if you are in center now, um, they do those flow sheets for you. But when you go home, you want to make sure that you're um, kind of you, talking about what, your, what all your uh, numbers are, right? So what is your blood pressure, your temperature, what are the numbers when you do dialysis and this next to me connected health captures all those numbers and then we'll send it over to your team and so should they see anything out of line or if you have any questions there's a place where you can always write notes to your healthcare team they can um, look at it they can call you the next day and answer it and so I really feel like I'm connected and not alone okay so what I'd like to do right now is I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, so give me one second here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is change to my other camera. So here I go. Give me one second here to change to my HD camera. Okay. And you guys, there you go. You can see my machine. And so I know you don't see me right now, but that's not important. It's more important that you see the machine. So this is the cartridge that we were talking about. And so what you see is that it all comes together. Okay. And I kind of uh, undid it a little bit, but it's a one step drop in. And so in order to set up the machine, all you need to do is you, you would open up the door and you would turn it on and the machine kind of blinks a minute. And then basically when it's gonna give me the green light, all I have to do is drop in this cartridge, push it in, I'm gonna, I would shut the machine and then I would spike my saline bag. So here's my saline bag. And then I would press the prime button and in about 20 minutes, the machine would be primed and ready to go. And so that's really nice because it doesn't take too long to prime. It's you know, really easy to, to do. And as I stated before, and I'm gonna come back now, I just wanted to show you kind of a real quick look at that. But um, what, I, what I love about it is that I'm able to set up the machine and then get on within 20 minutes. And so basically what I do in that time is I get all my supplies ready. And then as soon as basically the machine is done through Prime, I'm, I'm ready to jump on and, and do dialysis. So, I thought it was kind of a nice visual that I could share what the machine looks like and really how easy it is to set up. And I know like anything in the beginning, it can be really overwhelming and it can be scary. Um, and you might not feel like you could do something like this, but I, I just want to share that I felt that way myself and that home dialysis for me and for thousands of other people has really changed our lives. And we feel like we can thrive 
And that's also allowed us to stay healthy and be ready for transplant, and which is you know, exactly what the Brigham can, can combine and help us with. And so by being healthy and ready to get that transplant, you know, when your name is called, you'll be ready to go. You know? And so those are things to think about as well and maybe why you'd wanna do home, right? So think about those things. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Shan Draker and see if people have some questions for me. I'd love to be able to answer. Vanessa, I mean, that was absolutely wonderful. I mean, thank you so much for sharing your personal story for, with us. I mean, I think it, I'm sure that there are many patients who are watching this who found that just uh, extremely inspiring. Uh, you know, I think, you know, as caregivers, we are always uh, motivated, you know, by taking care of our patients. You know, we've been doing this for many years. And that's always what drives us. And it's, it's so wonderful uh, to see you go through that. And, you know, one of the things that it, it does, I mean, just like uh, peritoneal dialysis, is it really gives you control of your life. And I think just having the control cannot be understated, right? And that ability to say, I'm more in control of my life. I can do what I want to do. I can organize my life around this. And this isn't going to be, you know, the thing that I have to arrange everything around. And, you know, and it's inspiring. You have a family, you have a career, you know, you have a beautiful house. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope I set it up well. Tried to neaten it up a little bit. <laughs> so, so just before I ask, ask, ask uh, you some questions, I did want to answer one thing which I was going to mention uh, to uh, everyone anyway, and that is um, if people want to see these videos again, and, you know, because there's a lot of information in there, or if you want to show them to uh, members of your family, or share them with uh, other patients, uh, you'll be able to access the recordings uh, on the Brigham Women's Facebook page. And uh, you can just type that into your into internet search, you'll be able to find that. And uh, also on the National Kidney Foundation New England uh, page. So that, uh, because I think there's a lot of information in there, people might well uh, want to view some of those things uh, again. So, um, so the first question, very practical question. So when you're traveling, how much pre-made solution do you end up traveling with? How much luggage do you need? A number of pounds or boxes of equipment? Because it looks pretty daunting. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, and I just changed to my uh, headset. So I just want to make sure that everyone can still hear me okay. Yep. Yeah? Okay, great. Um, so it's going to depend on your prescription, right? Because everybody, what's, what's so nice about a uh, home hemodialysis in, uh, in particular for me or in general is that we're not a one size fits all. Um, it is really going to be prescription based and that's going to be dependent on you, right? And so you're gonna work that out with your doctor to figure out what the right prescription is. Um, some of the things that I can tell you is that I basically am always, and you're probably always going to go with at least three items that you're gonna check in. So one is going to be the actual machine because that would be in a hard case and you need to check that in with a hard case. So that would be number one. Number two is I learned over time that uh, when you are traveling with your dialysis machine, you need to pack all of your ancillary supplies in a separate bag. So they're not supposed to be mixed with your regular clothes. Um, and actually, that, I think that actually makes sense just in general. It's a great way to organize. And so what I do is I have a separate bag that I always use when I travel. And I just kind of keep my, my supplies in that bag and I refill them uh, as I travel. So one, again, is the machine. The second is the bag that is going to have your ancillary supplies. And then third is your clothes, right? So third is going to be whatever you want to pack. Your, hopefully your big sun hats and bathing suits to somewhere warm. Um, and you'll pack that into a suitcase. So usually it's at least three suitcases. Um, the machine itself weighs about 75 pounds. When it is put into a hard case, it, it is heavy. It weighs uh, about 98 pounds. So what I tell patients to do and what I do myself is I have a cart. When I get to the airport, I just go and get one of those rent-a-carts that you can get right at the airport. Um, and I have uh, whoever is there with me help put it right onto the cart. 
Um, people are very helpful. I bring money uh, to tip people along the way. And honestly, once it's checked in, I just walk in like a regular person. So I go through the TSA and um, you know the regular check like everybody else and I don't have to worry about it um, until it's time for the pickup. And then I go again and I get a cart and I you know, will have somebody help me put it into the cart. I've never had a problem with people helping me. Um, I traveled actually many times by myself. Um, and you know, you just, again, like I had said, you have to take your time. You have to give yourself hours, allow yourself time to get there, allow yourself time to you know, speak with people. Actually, the Department of Transportation has um, a whole list on traveling with a portable dialysis machine. Uh, we do actually have that um, linked on the Next Stage website, so you could actually download it. And it just talks about the rules and regulations that you are allowed to travel with a portable dialysis machine for free because it's a life-saving medical device. And so one of, one of the questions we've had is, what do you think people's greatest fears are of doing home hemodialysis? Is it actually getting into the access itself? Is it the complexity? Is it the fear of messing it up? What do you think it is? So I, I can speak for myself and from what I've heard. I think for me, my greatest fear was the needles. Um, you know, for eight years, I, like I said, I went in center and I, I didn't even look at it. Um, and so the way that I was able to get over my fear, and I really love talking about this because I, I actually think it's super beneficial for patients, is we don't do a lot of self-care in center. We're maybe just starting to do that. And so what I started to do is basically self-care. And one of, my, one of the PCTs that was in the center, he really helped me. And we started by, he was like, okay, Vanessa, you are going to start by just watching the process. And so that's what I did for a couple of weeks. I watched him put the needles in, take the needles out. Right. And then the second step, he said, all right, so today you are going to take out at least one needle. And I was very nervous to do that, but he was right there. And we started with just taking out one needle. Then I graduated to two needles. And then the next step, we did the guided method. And the guided method is when I would put my hand, so this would be his hand and I would put my hand over his. And um, you know he was kind of guiding me on how to be able to put the needles in. And we did that for a couple of weeks until I graduated to the big day when it was my turn to do it. And I remember I was super nervous and I said, you know, you're gonna stand right in front of me. You're not moving, please be here for me. And so then I started putting the needles in and you know what I found out? I found out that it is so not as bad as I thought. And then it was like, why did I ever let anybody else do it for the last eight years, you know? Um, and you learn really quickly how to do it. And more importantly, you know when it feels right and you know when it doesn't. Like I learned really quickly, no, this needle doesn't feel right. I might infiltrate, you know, that's not gonna work. But uh, more importantly, knock on wood, I don't, I've never really infiltrated maybe once in like, you know, the 14 years because I know my body so well and I know so well like where to go and how to do it that I have total control of that. And the other piece that I think people worry about is what if there's an emergency or something happens, right? Because when we were in or when I was in the clinic, I would see people, their blood pressure would drop, they would throw up, they would have cramps, all the, and you know what, those things happen to me too. What I can tell you is because you're doing more frequent dialysis in general, and this is for me, those things don't really happen because you're mimicking more, it's more similar to how your healthy kidney would work and you're not trying to pull so much fluid and have these big shifts that the, the treatment is kind of a kinder, gentler treatment. And so those things in general for me have not happened. And so it, it's really interesting because when you talk to in-center patients, they're like, oh my God, I would never want to do that at home. I see what happens in center. But really more frequent is a totally different kind of treatment. And what you'll find is you actually like doing it more because you feel better. I know like when I haven't done a treatment, I'm, I'm ready to go be, to do another treatment because I, I like the way I feel every day. Um, and I, I never skip two days in a row, ever. 
that that's wonderful to hear. So, um, you know, I think from a physician's point of view, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. And that is, what information uh, would you have liked to have heard when you first found out that you needed to have some sort of dialysis treatment? Um, you know, how would you like that to have been laid out to you? What is, how can we do better in talking to our patients? Yeah, so, and, and that's a good question because I didn't, I didn't have any of that, right? It was 22 years ago. Um, what I think is really important is what we're doing right now is for patients to not only um, speak with their doctor, I think number one, they need real expectations. Like I, I would want to know, you know, really what, what are some of the statistics? How am I going to lead a normal life? Um, I think it's good to talk about, you know, the cardiovascular benefits that go with it, um, blood pressure. I think it's important to talk about, you know, if, if you're, I think PD, like we talked about, is a great start for residual function, but I also think that patients should know that then they can transition to HHD. I think being really real with patients and giving them real education is important. And I also think that it's important for patients to speak with other patients. Um, that have experienced home so they can ask all of these questions. And so advocacy is, is really very important and uh, really a good way to understand that, as well as being supported by their healthcare team to really learn kind of the clinical and educational pieces, right, that you guys can provide that an advocate can't necessarily provide. And then lastly, I think patients want to see the machines, right? That's why I thought it was so important for me to show you the machine here at my house and do a demo because they have visions of this big machine being at your home and it's gonna take so much time and you know what is that going to look like? And there's nothing better than really seeing what it looks like at home. And in the end, it doesn't matter to me that I have boxes in my family room. I'd rather have some boxes in my family room and live a normal life then go to a clinic and do dialysis, you know, around that schedule. And I, I have a saying that, you know, um, I, I do dialysis, right? I do dialysis to live. I don't live to do dialysis, right? Um, and, and chronic disease, like what patients have, is going to be with us forever. So why shouldn't we find a way that we can, main, you know, have this disease but maintain control and not only control, but have clinical benefits to live a long, you know, good life as normal as we can within the guidelines that we have. And I think that's wonderful. And you know, you're right. I mean, when home hemodialysis started, it was the big machines and it was, you know, changing all the plumbing and doing reverse osmosis to have the quality of the water to do that. But nowadays it is very different um, as you very beautifully demonstrated. And I think, yeah, you did a very such a comprehensive job. I think that you actually answered most people's questions. <laughs> questions that I did see coming up are already things that you've answered. Uh, you know, so I I think um, I don't know that there are any other questions. Sure. But uh, really appreciate that. And you know, I think with that, I really like to to wrap up the program. Uh, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank our other presenters. Um, I think this has been you know, uh, a great program. I certainly have learned uh, things today. Um, I'd like to uh, thank um, all of our sponsors. Oh, first of all, sorry, I'd like to um, just mention for those of you, uh, for nurses there, uh, and social workers, you can get continuing education credit for this. Uh, and if you uh, want to do that, you have to, uh, you can, if you attend one of these webinars, you'll get half of the credit if you attend Two, there will be, you get all of the credit, which, um, um, and, and yes, which reminds me that there is a second uh, part to this webinar. When we originally designed this, it's going to be a, a whole morning thing. And the second part is next week uh, on June the 24th, uh, also starting at uh, three o'clock where there'll be three different uh, presentations. We have to attend both of you on all of the uh, credit. Um, I'd also, again, like to thank our sponsors, Novartis, Veloxis, and Sanofi Genzyme uh, for uh, helping with this program. I think it's uh, been a very important uh, program. So again, we'd like to thank them 
uh, for their support. Uh, lastly, I'd like uh, to remind the attendees that they will be getting an email uh, survey um, uh, in the next day or two. Uh, it would be, it's very important for us that you answer that uh, honestly. Let us know if you like the program, what bit you liked, what bit you didn't like. We'd also like to know about suggestions for future meetings. We're thinking about doing this more frequently uh, and we'd certainly uh, appreciate any feedback that you'd have for us uh, on that. So with that, I'd like to thank you. This has been a presentation of the Brigham Women's Hospital Kidney Crossroads and the National Kidney Foundation. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you.